All right, um, I'm gonna hit you hard and fast with some things that you've never, probably never thought about. And if you've thought about them before, maybe some things I'm gonna say are gonna aggregate to them. And uh, I want you to watch this video a couple of times, um, hopefully with gaps in between, so you give uh, the Lord the greatest chance to take from it, add to it, and teach you what you need to know. So, um, these themes will be elaborated on in books that aren't out yet, but um, it's really important. So, the more time you have to fold it into your understanding and uh, being, the better. So, there's this concept of highway of righteousness. It's an end times theme. You'll see it if you search for it. It's all over the scriptures. It's all over Isaiah and um, in many other places. So, um, with a lot of things, it's, this, is, uh, this jacks into what I call God's sense of humor, although that's uh, certainly not the best way of putting it. Um, God represents things in different ways. There's a physical, there's a textual, there's a literal, there's a symbolic, and he just hits us again and again and again, hoping somehow some little piece of it is going to make it through our thick skulls and thick hearts. And the hearts are the bigger problem of the two of those. So Highway of Righteousness is one of those themes. And um, God will use whatever it is you understand to help you better understand whatever it is you don't understand. And this is hard for me because I've had a weird life with exposure to weird things and a lot of things. And so like, just as a really thin slice of this vocationally, I've done like 50 things for money. Uh, roofing, construction, plumbing, uh, insurance. I sold candy in high school. They thought I was a drug dealer and I was just selling pixie sticks. Um, <laughs> anyway, on and on and on. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I, obviously I, I currently I make money as a, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but currently I make money uh, programming and running a business and uh, doing science. And um, up until a year ago, I was a professor of computer science. And so he uses a lot of these things to teach me that probably wouldn't make sense to anyone who's had different experiences. And this is tricky because I have to transform those things from the way I receive them into the way other people will understand them. But this is how everyone has to do it in everything. Um, hardly anything on this planet receives the energy from the sun exactly how it's transmitted. All of God's works are transformers. Uh, and not the more than meets the eye kind, the electrical kind. Anyway, um, so highways of righteousness. The way I understand this is, uh, I'll just throw a couple of analogies, uh, to, I should say, to help you understand this. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, a knife. So typically you don't want to get cut by a knife, right? Um, so you, if you're going to grab a really sharp blade, use its handle. And if someone's attacking you with a knife and you're gonna do some ninja move, you're gonna grab the sides of the blade, not the blade, right? So with like a slap, I don't have free hands, but that's, anyway. Um, so if you set that edge upright like, like this, and then you drop something on it, nothing is just gonna sit on that edge. Everything will roll away from it. You're probably getting cut in the process. Now, Unfortunately, almost all of our interactions are like that with God, where he gives us a touch and we come away from it cut, and most people don't even bother to go back. So um, the goal in life is actually, I call it the inverse knife edge, because um, we want to find a way to get up on that edge and stay there. And it's just as hard and weird to do as it sounds with a knife. Um, now let's transition to another way of presenting this. Um, in a lot of yards, 
there's some kind of drainage slope, right? And um, let's say you have a big snowstorm and then a sudden hot day and all that water, all that, all that frozen water melts. It usually doesn't have enough places to go, but what you'll find is that um, in a lot of yards, you'll get a bunch of puddles because there isn't a uniform contiguous slope. Uh, a monotonic slope in math terms. I'm sorry, people are probably eating breakfast and they just puked because uh, I pulled out the math. Um, but <laughs> these uh, math isn't hard. It's just math teachers are bad. That's the truth of the matter. But people who, um, well, sorry, side note, I was about to rant. Um, so the, the yard slopes, right? Well, on a, on a well-designed yard, that water will all slope into something that drains really well, whether it's an explicit drain or it's just an area of ground that's relatively porous. Um, so if you were to like drop a soccer ball on such a yard, it would roll on its own accord down to the lowest point. And um, again, if we invert that idea, the opposite of that would be a yard that has one high point. And it would be such that no matter where you started in the yard, if, if you were a robot or, or something or a little kid and you could only understand very simple instructions, the instruction, go higher from wherever you are until you can't go higher anymore, would lead you to the high point in the yard, right? Okay, so maybe you're putting this together. The highway of righteousness is not a single point A to point B, and it is not a straight line. However, here are some properties of this highway. No matter where you are and where you started or where you end up on this landscape, if you go higher from where you are, you can keep doing that without stopping, and it will take you to the highest point there is. Um, okay, that's all you need to know. <laughs> there will be a physical representation of this highway in the last days. And we're in the last days, but this physical representation hasn't come yet. There will also be an ideological representation. And I've already explained that to you. It's in the book called Repentance, Making Straight the Way of God. This is the way. Um, so those are very big picture ideas. But let's flip this around because the big picture is made up of lots of little pictures. And if you start at the big picture, you can go to the little pictures and see them more clearly. If you start at the little pictures, you can flip those around and see the big picture more clearly. And you ought to do both all the time for the clearest picture. So, um, the idea of sacrifice is not something most people get excited about because they regard it as loss. And I wanna tell you something right here, right now, there's no such thing as loss with God. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists that we confuse for loss is trading up. There's a massive amount of trading up in God's kingdom, but there is no loss. There's never, ever, ever any time when God will ever ask you to sacrifice anything unless and except it is the only way to receive something far better. It's a swap. You never, ever lose anything. Well, the reason it seems like we lose things is because one, we get hung up on the invitation and we never actually do it to see the outcome. Or um, two, we just get confused because we don't see all the mechanics and connections on the other side or time confuses us or whatever. Just the constraints of our environment that are necessary to enable faith, they uh, slip us up a bit. But that's the way it works. God never asks for anything unless he's immediately giving you or, or at least ordaining for you to receive something far better in return. 
And that sounds transactional and it leaves out the biggest component, which is his, um, his, uh, his, his, his loving kindness, which, um, is a huge topic on its own. Anyway, so how does this relate to the highway of righteousness or, uh, making straight the way of God? Well, um, that fine edge, um, it is really easy to fall off of, and it's really hard to find. So it's hard to find, it's hard to stay on. It's not because it's confusing once it's laid out to you, it's extremely uh, simple, but it's not easy. And one of the ways we can get sidetracked um, in either direction is one, uh, not being willing to sacrifice, or two, misunderstanding sacrifice and making it the end instead of the means to the end. All right, let me try to unpack that one. I'm gonna try to do this as fast as I can. So um, when someone is introduced to the gospel for the first time, and let's say that they weren't raised in that environment or they were raised in an environment that had the look but not the feel. And so they're, they're exposed to a real thing for the first time or some semblance of it. Probably the principal component of that experience for the person is I have to give up all these things in my life. I can't do this anymore. I have to do this instead, whatever. Um, so that's, uh, you could call that sacrifice, right? Um, I think a better way of looking at that is I have to get used to the idea of learning and doing God's will above my own in all things. That's not always taught or practiced, but I think that's better. Um, but let's just go with the traditional, I have to stop doing this or never do this or whatever. Well, um, there is immense value in reconciling yourself to a set of external standards. It's really important. And I'm not going to go into this right now. We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours and bust out the law of Moses and all sorts of things. But... That is not the end. The end is not in what you give or what you do. The end is what you become. And if you become, you will do, but you do from within, not to align to something without. Does that make sense? You could watch this again. Um, again, this is just Cliff Notes trying to seed the ground. Um, so um, we'll kick off a process in you, and then when the details come later, you'll be more perceptive and receiving of it. Um, so uh, in, in trying to get onto this highway of righteousness, you absolutely have to sacrifice all things. Um, what that looks like for a particular person depends a whole lot on a whole lot of things. It is not a uniform thing. But um, you really know it when you do it, whatever the details consist of. But here's how someone going in that path correctly can get hung up, is if they hold on to this idea that everything is already processed for them. Um, I made a video about priests and chopping things. And who's the high priest? It's Jesus. Does he ever get done chopping? Well, not until we're like him. And uh, I don't see tons of people lining up to say they've, uh, they've made it already. So um, we ought to expect that the standards that we have to sacrifice to hold in the beginning, we ought to expect that those are refined and divided and changed and replaced over time. And what it's like is like zooming into a fractal. It's still the same exact thing, but when it comes in much higher resolution, the details change. It's still the same thing. The same equation drew the thing. That's how they're drawn. But we're just seeing it in much higher detail. And those details shift our understanding and our application. And so 
um, if you see somebody clinging tightly to the same exact standards they had in the beginning, odds are they've missed the boat. Maybe they haven't missed the boat, they just, they're stuck at the dock. They haven't set it out to sea yet and really done what they're supposed to do with it. Um, then there's the other way, which we really have to talk about and I have to warn you about because this is really dangerous, is you come the other way. I guess the first way is dangerous too, right? It's what killed Jesus, or what caused people to kill Jesus. The second way um, is to think that somehow you can not go into the gate, which is sacrifice of all things, among many other ways that could be described, um, but you don't go into the gate, and instead of reconciling yourself to exactly how you think God is, according to your present understanding, you try to jump over the gate and claim that you live according to the spirit of the law, even though there's a whole pile of stuff or maybe just really specific situations where you willingly do exactly what you know is wrong, according to your present understanding. And that's the danger of... Um, Everything that God reveals has consequences. And um, one aspect of that dichotomy is that when God reveals more information, it can be used to help yourself or it can be used to harm yourself. It's like this with everything. And so um, this is why if, you know, people have a tendency to abuse this idea of a highway of righteousness and they'll say, Oh, I'm living the spirit of the law, um, but I would never sell everything I have and give to the poor, even if God explicitly popped out of heaven and told me to do it because um, uh, whatever. I, you know, I'm better than that or whatever. Who knows? Who cares? But the point is that uh, people do this all the time. It's a really strong tendency. It's actually, it's harder for someone, I think, to go in the, the to, to, um, I don't, I'm not going to go there. I don't know if what I was about to say is actually right, but it's, they're both hard, I guess. But I just, I would imagine that people would be more likely to make this mistake because it's cheaper to make. Like you, you can't abuse sacrificing all things without sacrificing all things, right? And who's going to do that? Very few people. And, and just because they've done that doesn't mean they're on the highway of righteousness that they're going to stay there. It just means that they actually have spent, so to speak, a lot more than anyone who has not yet done that. But, um, <clears throat> but a, a person can very easily say, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm just, I'm living the spirit of the law and I follow everything that God tells me and whatever when they're lying to themselves and everyone else because the truth is that they've held back massive amounts in their heart. <laughs> And as God pours out more and more light and truth onto the world, and more of these consequences roll forth, uh, we will approach a situation with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, I think were their names, who, um, who both died because they were lying about what it is they were doing and why. And uh, no one killed them except for God. Um, so um, this is really serious. And if, I guess the final thing I'll say about this is um, that, um, oh, I've almost lost the thought. If you, oh, okay. So um, yeah, one of the potential illusions about this is that you ever stop making the sacrifice of all things. Um, this is a big topic and I talk about it in the justice book, which isn't out yet, um, even though it's done. Uh, it's not a one-time thing. It's an attitude that never stops. And um, so those people who I described as making this on-ramp of the sacrifice to all things to get onto this highway of righteousness, it's not that they stop doing that. They don't let go of their zeal or their uh, intensity or their um, uh, the completeness of their attitude, their integrity, of their approach. It's just that it shifts in what it looks like and feels like. And the shift doesn't make it easier, by the way. It is much harder to uh, truly live by the law of the Spirit than it is to keep some prescribed set of rules. Um, 
I, I was, uh, I lived a very prescriptive set of rules for many years without fail, without any fail. Um, and it seems like a lot of people struggled with that. And for me, it's just needed to be done. I don't think it was easier, but I didn't struggle with that. Um, and I'll tell you that there was never a time where I had to do that uh, out of, you know, in any great peril to myself or others or my reputation or whatever. I mean, it was all really lightweight stuff compared to actually doing whatever it is that God tells you whenever it is he tells you to do it. Um, and, and not doing the things that don't fit that. So anyway, I'm over 20 minutes. This is really, really important. So I hope that you hit the scriptures and look these things up, learn more about them, pray about them, and most importantly, live them. And prepare yourself for the things that the Lord is going to send you, because it's big.